what's going on friends concurrency and parallelism are two ways you can speed up your program in this lesson i will explain these two concepts i will also discuss some misconceptions about multi-threading and multi-processing without any delay let's get started concurrency happens when multiple tasks are running at a time this means we are dealing with a lot of things at once for instance you have four assignments to complete and you want to finish them as soon as possible you start the first assignment then stop at some point you move to the second one after working on the second assignment for a while you stop and switch to the third this process continues until all the four assignments are finished if you notice we are not simultaneously working on the assignments we are only switching context from one task to another any system that works like this is said to be concurrent in a single core cpu the ability to switch between multiple tasks is known as concurrency. We can achieve concurrency by using threads and asynchronous programming. In threading, we can have multiple threads and the operating system actually knows about each thread. The OS can interrupt a thread at any time to start running a different thread. Now that you understand the meaning of concurrency, let's explain parallelism. Parallelism means executing multiple tasks at exactly the same time. Parallelism is about doing a lot of things simultaneously. Going by the example we used before, we can have four different people, each assigned a single task. In this case, we are doing all the four assignments simultaneously. I hope you can now see the difference between parallelism and concurrency. Let's take a look at the differences. Multi-threading and asynchronous programming can be achieved on a single core system. For multi-threading, the OS decides when to switch between tasks. Multiprocessing is only possible in a multi-core system where tasks can run simultaneously on different processors. Each approach has its own advantages and disadvantages. The best choice for a particular application will depend on specific requirements. We will cover how to choose the right approach later. This code downloads the content of the websites in a given list. We are going to rewrite this code to use multi-threading, multiprocessing and async I.O. Before we start the implementations, I would like to show you the syntax for each of the approaches. First, let's start with threading. To create a thread, we need an instance of the thread class. Let's import the thread class from the threading module. From threading, import thread. Now, let's create an instance of a thread. Thread equals thread. There is a couple of arguments we can pass to the class. The target refers to the function we want this thread to execute. We can also send some arguments to the function. Let's create a function named task, def task. The function takes x as a parameter. Then let's print something on the screen in the function body. Thread executed value to be x. Now we can pass the new function as the target, which is task. And also, we can pass the arguments, ax, a tuple, let's say 9. Once a thread is created, we can run the thread, which will execute the function we passed to it. The start method is used to run a thread, thread.start. One thing you should know about the start method is that it doesn't block, meaning it returns immediately. It doesn't wait for the function to complete. We can demonstrate this by using the time module to cause a delay in the thread. Import time. Now we can say time dot sleep to sleep for five seconds. Let's put a print statement after the start method. Waiting for the thread. Let's run the program to see what happens. As you can see, the line following the start method is immediately executed. It doesn't wait for the thread to be complete. We can wait for the task to finish by using the join method. Thread.join The join method will wait for the thread to finish its execution. It also blocks the rest of the code until the thread finishes its execution. This print statement will be executed after the task is completed. Let's run the program again. Great, the line after the join method was executed when the thread terminates. An alive thread means that the run method of the thread instance is currently executing. We can check if a thread is alive by using the isAlive method. Thread 
dot is alive. Let's call the is alive method after the thread has started. Let's also use it after the join method. Now let's execute the program. Before we start the thread, the thread is dead. Then after the start method, the status is true. And also after the join method, the status is false. So far we've only created a single thread. Let's see how we can create multiple threads. I'm going to comment out this slip. Let's make use of the range function for x in range of 5 t equals thread the target is the task. We can also pass the arguments then we can say t dot start to start the thread. Now let's run the program. So this is how we can create multiple threads. If we need to wait for all the threads to complete then we can make use of a container to hold all the threads which is for all the threads equals an empty list. Then we can say threads dot append to add each of the threads to the threads. And finally we can say for each in threads each dot join to wait for each of the threads. A race condition is when two threads run the same code and access or update the same resource. You can use a lock to ensure that only one thread at a time executes a sensitive section of the code. We need to import lock and create an instance of the lock. Lock. Then we can create an instance of the lock before the thread. Lock equals lock. Now we can pass this lock as an argument to the task. Then we need to update the task to accept lock. We can then use a context manager for the lock. With lock, this lock ensures that only one thread can execute this part of the code at a time. The thread pool executor class was designed to be easy and straightforward to use. Let's import the class from concurrent.futures import thread pool executor. We can now make use of the class by using a context manager with thread pool executor class max workers the max workers refers to the number of threads two threads as executor on the executor class we can call the map method the first argument we need to pass to the map method is the function which is the function we intend to run in the thread the second argument we need to pass is an iterable items items equals 1 2 for each element in the iterable the task function will be called and the element is passed as an argument to the function the map method will return an iterable immediately the iterable returned from the map method can be used to access the results from the function so we can say results equals we can then use a for loop to access the contents of results for results in results print results let's make the task function to return a value now let's execute the program great as you can see we are able to access the returned value let's comment out this part of the code now let's execute the program again it works that's how to use the map method on the executor. The second method we can use is the submit method. The submit method submits one task to the thread pool for execution. Let's try that out. With thread pool executor, executor dot submits. The first argument we need to pass to the submit method is the function to be executed by the thread. The function is task. And also all arguments to the function. Let's say one. This method returns a future object immediately. So we can say future equals this. And the value returned by the future object is future dot results. Let's print the result on the screen. Print results. Let's execute the program again. One is returned. To create a process, we need an instance of the process class. Let's import the process class from multiprocessing from multiprocessing 
imports process. We can create a process by creating an instance of the process class. We can pass a couple of arguments, the targets, the arguments, and so on. Let's pass the targets to be the function. And also we can pass the arguments to be one. We can then use the start method to start the process. We can also use the join method, process.join. The join method waits for the process to terminate. Let's execute the program. Great. This is how to create a single process. Now let's create multiple processes. Let's make use of the range function for x in range of 4. p equals process. Then the target to be the task. And also, we can pass the arguments as x, which is the value in the range, process the start. So this is how we can start multiple processes. Python provides an easier way to create multiple processes. We can use the process pool executor to create multiple processes. Let's import the process pool executor, process pool executor, with process pool executor, then we need to mention the number of processes as max workers, let's say two. As executor results equals executor dot map. We need to pass the function and also an iterable one and two for results in results. Print results. The map method will return an iterable immediately. This is similar to how we used the map method on the thread pool executor. We can also make use of the submit method. The submit method submits one task to the process pool for execution. A synchronous program is executed one step at a time. When each step is complete, the program moves on to the next one. An asynchronous program also takes one execution step at a time. It may not wait for an execution step to be completed before moving on to the next one. This means that the program will move on to future execution steps, even though a previous step hasn't yet finished. Asynchronous programming is implemented in Python using coroutines. Any function defined with the async keyword is a coroutine. When a coroutine is called, it returns a coroutine object. This is similar to the usage of the yield keyword in a generator. When a generator is called, it returns a generator object. The await keyword suspends the execution of read data coroutine until db.fetch data completes and returns the data. Let's call this read data coroutine read data. We can just comment out this part. Pass. Let's print the output on the screen. Print. Now let's execute the program. The function call returns a coroutine. We also get a runtime error because the coroutine was created but never executed. We can execute the coroutine by using the async IO package. Let's import the async IO package. Point coroutine was executed. Now let's execute the coroutine async IO dot run. The run function executes the coroutine and returns the result. So we can pass the coroutine to the run function. Now let's execute the program to see the output. Great, coroutine was executed. Let's make the coroutine to return a value, return 5. So now we can say result equals this. Now let's print the result on the screen. Result, result. Let's run the program again. It works. All right, friends. This code downloads the content of the websites in the given list. This is the synchronous version. We also have the async version. The async version is making use of the async IO module. As you can see, we also have the multi-threading version. We are making use of the thread pool executor class to create multiple threads. Let's check the multiprocessing version. The multiprocessing version is also making use of the process pool executor class to create multiple processes. The synchronous version takes approximately 18 seconds.
the asynchronous version takes one second, the multiprocessing version takes four seconds, and also the multi-threading version takes four seconds. So the question now is when should we use asynchronous multi-threading or multiprocessing? The first thing you need to figure out is if your program is input-output band or CPU band. CPU band programs push the CPU to its limit. This includes programs that do image processing, searching, data processing, and so on. Input-output band programs spend time waiting for a result from an external device. This includes querying the database, making network calls, reading and writing to a file, and so on. Multiprocessing speeds up Python operations that are CPU intensive because they benefit from multiple cores and avoid the global interpreter lock. Threads are best for input-output operations involving external systems because threads can combine their work more efficiently. You also use asynchronous programming for input-output operations. Coroutines are more lightweight than threads. We may have thousands of threads in a Python program, but we could easily have hundreds of thousands of coroutines all in one thread. This is the summary of what we've learned in this lesson. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Thanks.